Okay, we're here with uh, Oliver Morris of the International National Trust Organization. Oliver, what's the national trusts around the world? Why are they concerned about climate change? It's really quite simple because uh, the, the issue for um, the national trusts around the world, they are responsible for uh, preserving and conserving the cultural heritage, be it tangible or intangible. And our concern is that that cultural heritage, indeed the very cultures themselves, are threatened by climate change. And we have been, uh, ever since we, we last met in, uh, in Cancun, um, we have been concerned, and indeed I, I think I said to you then that we, we wanted to have a higher profile here in Durban. And by getting a booth as we have here, and also um, by hoping, hoping to have a side event. And we're, we're putting across the message that it is those very cultures that are threatened by climate change. We don't hear the word culture mentioned very often, in fact, hardly at all. And for example, if you take um, the situation in Uganda where uh, the average temperatures have risen enormously and the snow on, the, on Mount Ronzori, for example, is melting very fast, in the last hundred years, it's reduced from six square kilometers down to one square kilometer. And the people living at the foot of the mountain, uh, they, they're, they're snow gods, live in those mountains, and they think the gods are angry because the snow's melting. They don't, they, they don't understand that it's to do with climate change, and it's the industrialized countries that are actually causing the problem. Now, it's not going to be long, about 30 years, and there will be no snow or glaciers at all on those mountains that's going to affect them, where does their snow god live? I mean, we, we may think that that is, um, you know, rubbish, but, or not, you know, quite funny to think of it, but actually this is uh, the situation around many different countries. It's the same in the Andes, it's the same all over the world, in fact, where these, the, in the developing world, where the, you know, some of these sites are really sacred, and it really means a lot to them. Now, if they lose that, they lose their culture, in a sense. The other aspect of that particular point is that once the snows have melted, already the rivers are drying up. That is affecting agricultural communities further down. Agriculture is going to change. Already in Uganda, the droughts are, 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 are much longer, and in, in many parts of Africa, in fact, the droughts are, are, are much longer now than they used to be. And when the rains come down, they're, f they're far more rain. It's, the storms are, are, are much more, uh, hell of a lot more rain coming down. And so when they try to grow their crops, either it, the seeds die because of the drought or they're washed out because of the rain. So it's a no-win situation. Now they rely in Uganda, 70% of the population relies on, on medicinal herbs. What's going to happen to that cultural aspect? You know, these, these are some of the issues. Now, Intu's role, I mean, that's an example of the problems showing what, what the situation is regarding, regarding cultures. Uh, a, a more obvious example is what happens to the cultures of the people living in Kiribati, for instance. You know, if and when, I'm afraid it's not so much if, but at the present rate of, of global warming, the sea level rises, Kiribati is going to be submerged. Tuvalu is going to be submerged. There are plenty of other examples. What happens then? The whole culture will have to be transported to another area. The whole, all the, the whole community, if they go to Australia, for example, um, their culture obviously completely disappears and all their cultural heritage goes with it. It goes under the sea. It's a huge issue for these people. And we want to get the message across to uh, the people in power that climate change, they must be talking not just about the physical aspect, and the natural side, but they must also be talking about the effects on cultures, on the very people themselves. Because so many, so millions of people of the population don't really understand what's happening. And, and I think that if we can get the message out, they will understand far better that it is actually the de developed world that is causing the problem for them in the, in the developing countries. So that is, that is our challenge. And you hear a lot here about the, the physical impacts, as you've said, and, and, and not the cultural impacts. Perhaps this is an obvious question, um, or there's an obvious answer to this, and I'm sure there is. But why is it important to maintain culture? Why, why is that something that you know, really is top of your agenda? Because it, because it is 
part of the, the, the structure. I mean, if you, let, let me just explain about this, um, this pamphlet here. This is the Victoria Declaration, which uh, we had a conference in Victoria and British Columbia. It's our biennial conference. It happens every other year. And it happened last October, a month ago. And 250 delegates there all unanimously supported the Victoria Declaration. Now, if, if I just point to this first paragraph, the failure to communicate the threat of climate change in terms which describe the dire implications for cultural identity, diversity and sustainability and consequential social degradation fundamentally weakens the prospects for global reform to combat climate change. And then if you look here, the destruction of culture is a fundamental breach of the principle of intergenerational equity in that a culture destroyed or, or diminished within the time of the current generation will deprive the members of future generations of their right to their cultural inheritance. So that, in a sense, directly answers your question. So it sounds like there's, there's two things here, that this is fundamentally about people's way of life and that if they understand that, they're more likely to do something, but in itself it's worth protecting. What, what is Into doing? Or how are you responding to this, this challenge? Well, we are, we're here. We're, we're, we're get, trying to get this message out. We hope to be holding a side event next week, um, and we should be speaking to this problem, raising the awareness. We have a, a, a working party, a, a youth group, who came to me yesterday and asked if they could um, help in any way with, with this. And they have taken a copy of the Victoria Declaration, and I hope they're going to be using it as one of their projects. They're going to look at it and see if they can develop an action plan to, to give back to me as to how we can take it forward. So that, that's an extremely useful thing. And, and, and actually, it is the youth that we need really to interest in this, if I may say so, because they are the next generation. One of, one of the, the huge issues that I find all around the world, and certainly at these climate change conferences, all we hear is of countries, the, develop, the developed world, uh, they seem to be, for example, Canada pulling out probably of the Kyoto Protocol. Complete disaster, frankly, and, uh, and, and one wonders really, you know, we, the political will, one wonders if the political will is really there. And I have a, a, a real issue with this because I actually believe politicians are not the right people to be making these decisions. Um, the politicians are there for the next five years if they're lucky, and then they're always looking to see if they're going to have a job in, you know, within a very short time frame. We are here to try to protect the heritage of the world forever, for everyone, for not this generation, not the next five years, 100 years, 200 years, in the future. Politicians have a very, very short time scale because of their job. That's all their job is, really. I mean, if they may be re-elected for another five years, but I mean, that, you know. So th there's a real issue here. Now, and also, the industrialised nations, the, there are so many vested interests in making sure that the, um, the, the, the global emissions and all those things uh, from the industrialised world, the, 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 the actual industrialists themselves, they, most of them, I'm sorry to say, don't seem to have a conscience about the effect that they are having on the developing countries. And that is a real issue. And I shall go on banging this drum all the times I'm here and continue to bang it in the future. Because I really feel very strongly that governments in the develop, developed world, they really need to take more interest and in, in notice of what is going on. And I just don't think that the political will is there at the moment. And that is a crying shame in my view. Oliver, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us.